hear me? So I have the microphone attached, perfect now. I hear the inference. Perfect, hello. Um, yeah, my name is Philip Kanel. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm talking about, as just mentioned, inferring cause form effect, a weight prediction case study. It's a case study because it's not a working product feature yet. So I'm going to show you today something yeah, which is currently in a trial of assessment, really. A proof of concept, if you will. I hope it's still interesting for you. And it's also not really a landscape uh, talk. But yeah, a use case relevant for, for healthcare. So Viva is a healthcare, uh, health tech company, healthcare provider, um, with a goal to fight obesity and diabetes across the European market. Quickly to the background, the WHO finds that 59% of the European population suffer from overweight or obesity. And this obesity is responsible for 13% of the death of people, either directly or indirectly, via comorbidities like severe diabetes. Uh, overweight or obesity also leads to 8% total health costs, or they constitute 8% of the total health costs, even a little bit more in the United Kingdom. This aggregates up to $70 billion per year in the European market, uh, Euro European healthcare system. Generally, one can say that over a lifetime of obese patient um, yeah, 25% more costs need to be spent than on an average person. So Oviva is yeah, essentially placing itself in this market. It's a blended care approach for building healthy habits. And with Oviva, you have essentially uh, your um, yeah, digital diary at your fingerprints and a direct channel to your coach. A coach is usually a dietitian or a nutritional expert. And after an initial uh, meeting with your, with your coach, at, either via phone or in person, you then uh, venture out, use your, use your app, you can look at learned content, you can track all your habits, you can measure your weight, you can, when you're walking and uh, doing activities, you can all track it in the app, but you can also track your, your meals. Like I brought a small picture here of a maybe a little bit caloric heavy dish, which is a, a burger, and um, yeah, you can do this essentially for all your meals. And we have some convolutional neural network in the background running, which extracts us some, some structured data from it, some, some tags. You see the salad leaves and chips. And um, yeah, those pictures are usually the, um, yeah, the foundation with which the, the coach can work. So it gets a good idea of the dietary signature of the patient. And we also pull some structured data out of this, which we then use for, for other use cases. For example, the one I'm going to discuss next. Next. Did I switch it off by accident? Ah, here we go. All right. Um, yeah, a weight prediction product feature. Let's hypothesize a little bit what benefits could it bring to our business. Firstly, it would facilitate coaching by automatically generating dietary recommendations tailored to our users. But it might also be helpful to point towards patients who struggle more than others. Those, uh, yeah making it possible for the coaches to better scope their, their uh, yeah, work time. It would drive engagement by disclosing what meals and activities merit towards a weight goal. And what I have in mind is a fully interpretable and causal model, essentially, so that as a user, you would really see how your habits relate to your weight journey. This also uh, closes a very important feedback loop, lifting the app from a solely digital diary to essentially a self-hacking tool. Hopefully, it would fight churn even by exposing potential future reward, which is the weight loss in our business. And yeah, the underlying statement is essentially that behavioral realignment is challenging immediately, but rewarding only in the long run. So you can imagine when you start your, your weight journey, your diet, you have to, um, you cannot eat all the things that you want to eat, you or need to eat less. And it's, it's really tough on most of our patients. And then after one week, you step on the scale and the, the result is actually marginal. And the reason for this is that weight change happens on very, very slow time scales. So very long time scales, if you will. So it's very, very slow. And as a hypothesis, showing this to the patients where you could end up with uh, down the road, I think is a very, very strong argument. All right. So we don't want to build only a predictive model. We want to actually be able to derive interventions from our model. And for this, observing data is usually not enough. And to illustrate this, I brought a small toy example here. So we have a collected data set of three data rows, essentially looking at two variables, rain and people with umbrellas. 
Throughout the first two days, it was raining, and we observed people with umbrellas. On the third day, there was no rain, and neither people with umbrellas. Now we train a model on this uh, modest data set and uh, challenge it to predict some missing data on the fourth and the fifth day. So on the fourth day, we have no rain. The model correctly infers there is no people with umbrellas. On the fifth day, there were people with umbrellas, and there was also rain. Correct. So now we change the connotation slightly of the data that we provide. We say on the sixth day, we'll make it stop raining. So really uh, interact with the environment actively. And on the seventh day, we actually force people to carry umbrellas around by, I don't know, giving them some incentives to do so. And we, again, task the model with the, with the inference task. And on the sixth day, it does, it does right so. With people who will not carry umbrellas if we make it stop rain. But on the seventh day, when we force people to carry umbrellas, the, model will, the predictive model would say yes. So why is this model struggling with this? The model does not, has not encoded the causal structure of how the world really works, which is something very easy for us. The model cannot simply learn it by observing data. So everyone, our, each one of us in our heads, essentially, we have this causal representation that rain causes people to carry umbrellas around. And yeah, those graphs are essentially called directed acyclic graphs. And essentially, the strongest argument is the missing arrows. And there's no arrow from umbrellas into rain, which always indicates conditional independence. So essentially, the probability of raining when you force people to carry umbrellas just collapses back down the probability of raining. So at best, the model would look at its data at the baseline. There, it observed two out of three days it was raining. So it should maybe provide here two over third, because it's independent of whether people carry umbrellas or not. So what is the causal mechanism for weight change? And by experience and from, from research, we know that it's actually the caloric intake rate. Not only caloric intake, but also caloric expenditure. But just leave it for simplicity at the caloric intake rate. Those two variables, so caloric integrate causes our weight to change. And those two variables, unfortunately, are not freely accessible. So they are unobserved, highlighted by the, by the dashed line. What we do observe, however, through our app, are app meal logs and app body weight measurements that the user can, can put into the app. But all measurements, unfortunately, suffer from random and systematic bias. What we do know, however, is or what we do have is a rough idea of the data generating process. It always starts with the habits of a user. The habits of the user determine whether a user is willing to actually take a picture of his meal on the plate and whether he's willing to step on the scale and type it into the app. But it also determines what comes on the table, so the dietary profile, which in turn also affects the picture that you get and the labels that we generate throughout the app. The dietary profile determines directly the caloric integrate that the user is yeah, taking to himself or herself, which in turn affects the body weight, of which we just have a noisy proxy in the app due to some measurement error. All right. So as you see, there's no direct path from the apnea logs into the body weight. But we do have a correlation. Apnea logs and body weight are correlated. However, they are confounded by habits. So users who are very, very engaged with the app, um, they usually lock a lot, three times a day, five times a day even, and they're also very adherent to the treatment, so they tend to do, to perform much better uh, throughout the treatment, so in terms of weight goal. Um, but, yeah, so and essentially basing interventions on this level, like intervention, imagine asking the patients to lock more, to lock more salad, to lock more anything, um, and gauging the effect that it will have on the body weight will always be confounded by this habits through this back door. So if you want to formulate interventions, they should always be directly on the caloric intake rate. And this is what we try to do um, moving forward. We are going to model the caloric intake rate and inform it by the app meal logs, thus closing the back door through the habits. All right. For this, we employ two layers, essentially. We have a latent model, modeling those two variables that we do not observe. And for this, we have, at its core, the energy balance equation, which is a well-founded equation in physiological science of how the human weight changes. So we have the time derivative of the weight over time, which essentially is equal to the difference between the intake rate, which is informed by the, by the uh, meal logs that we have, minus some expenditure rate, which itself is linear in weight. So if you can imagine climbing stairs, 
your body metabolism, keeping your body temperature at 37 degrees Celsius, all scales linear with body weight. So we have essentially an expenditure density multiplied by the weight. And the expenditure den density essentially listens to, or is informed by the activity that the user also locks into the app. If intake rate and expenditure density both are both constant, then the weight trajectory assumes always an exponential towards some steady state. We will see about this uh, on the next slide, I think. All right, and then on top we have an observational model because we're observing the body weight measurements, but they are usually a noisy estimate of your true weight. So we have some measurement error, which we model as some, some um, normal, with, uh, normal uh, with zero mean and some standard deviation sigma. Causes for this are essentially yeah, rounding errors, the finite resolution of the scale, wrong reading, varying clothes, or di uh, drinking, eating toilet, going onto the toilet just before the measurement. All those things that do not have a physiological effect of your real weight, essentially. All right, a quick note on the training. So we're doing parameter estimation via the Bayesian inference. And uh, we have essentially a Bayesian formula and it takes into two main ingredients. One is the data likelihood, which is defined by the model. It essentially states how likely, is, or how likely it is to observe your data given all possible sets of parameters. Parameters are theta in this case here. Yeah. It encodes all sources of uncertainty. Um, so the measurement noise we just discussed, but also the uncertainty about the diet at start and between observations. And it is fueled by data of 9,500 users, essentially weight logs, meal logs, and activity logs. Secondly, and here a Bayesian approach really shines, uh, is the prior parameter estimate. So the prior belief of the value range of the parameters. So, and you can imagine we want to, as part of the parameters, we also have the caloric values of all our attacks. And you can imagine that we know a priori that salad has lower caloric value than, for example, cheese. And we actually ventured out and used our research partner at University of Bern to provide us with the nutritional uh, value ranges of all the, the text that Oviva uses. So we have a very informed prior estimate here. And the multiplication of data likelihood and prior estimate yields us the posterior parameter estimate, which is essentially the updated belief probability of variables given the data. And it's untractable, so we have to sample from it, and we do this via Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo sampling for all the population parameters, and then during runtime for prediction, we can actually employ Kalman filtering to get the posteriors for the time variant, uh, for the time dependent variables. All right, let's yeah, illustrate how we could uh, validate our model, and in the Bayesian approach, simulation is always key for this. So, um, and this also plays into a very typical use case that we have at Oviva. This is that of habit slipping. So imagine the user Monte Carlo had 98 kilograms as of January 2022. And she started her treatment, and uh, she was able to reduce her integral rate from 3,100 kilocalorie to 2,600 kilocalorie. So she was very motivated in the beginning. And now we split into two scenarios on the left-hand side. Monte Carlo is essentially, so let's maybe, maybe some, tell you something about the graphs. We have the, the weight graph here on the top, and the uh, caloric integrate on the bottom. I don't know whether it's a little bit small. But uh, essentially what we have here is she is able to maintain her reduced caloric integrate of around 2,600 kilocalorie throughout the yeah, half year until July 2022. In the second case, actually she starts off motivated, but her weight, uh, her caloric integrate starts creeping up again. Her old habits sneak in, she eats maybe, maybe larger portions again or starts eating the wrong stuff. So in the first case, in case of a constant uh, integrate, the weight response is that of an exponential towards her new steady state weight. It's very slow as you see, but after, after half a year, she lost around seven kilograms. On the right-hand side, the weight initially goes down, but then reaches a turning bar, uh, point around March 2022. So now let's run inference over this. So we're just using the, the weight data to infer the intake data that we provided to the model, uh, that we initially provided, and want to see whether the model gets it roughly right. Now you have to apologize, it's also a little bit hard to see, but I hope you get the idea. We have now the, the, the posterior uncertainty, 95% of its mass around the weight, essentially to infer the noise filtered weight, and we're also inferring the intake rate. And we get the trends right. On the left-hand side, the intake rate assumes a constant of around 2,600 kilocalories, and in the second case, the intake rate, it's a little bit biased towards uh, lower calories, but it takes the uplift it uh, learns the uplift from, from the weight data. And the beauty now is, 
thinking about the use case that um, Monte Carlo and the right-hand side cases was actually losing weight until March 2022. So just eyeballing the weight do, uh, points for the coach, it would be hard to actually see that, uh, that Monte Carlo and the right-hand side case is slipping and starting creeping back to her old habits. Only in March 2022, moving forward, one sees that the weight response is actually going up again. But knowing the integrate, one could actually place an intervention much earlier. All right, so these were simulated users, but it's actually a ground truth for our Oviva users. So th those are yeah, real users, and they all exhibit the same pattern. We have initial weight loss, and then after some time, patients start creeping up again with their weight, essentially. And in all cases, we're actually to see the, the reversal of the trend and integrate earlier before we actually see it in the weight. We can even make it more uh, obvious for, for our coaches. Uh, we could, for example, provide of meeting a target weight uh, by the end of, of some, some certain period, and uh, which would be a direct indicator for a coach to look more closely into this particular patient. All right. We don't want to stop there. We want to actually put interventions on, on, the, on the diet of the user. And this is really work in progress now towards an automated and personalized nutrition advisor. That's how we call it. So on the right-hand side, we have a waterfall graph which uh, lists all the habits of the user and along with it, the impact on the prognosed weight by the end of 90 days here. So for example, uh, having, yeah, having dairy products, consuming dairy products eight times per week will be an equivalent in the yeah, energy balance equation of roughly two kilograms lost by the end of the period, which is heavily counterbalanced, unfortunately, by carbohydrate-rich products like bread, bread and eggs, and cereals. Also, the patient was quite diligent. Uh, yeah. Walking, for example, the patient locked a lot of walking, which is an equivalent of three kilograms. This is all nice and good to identify what are the main drivers of weight change, but we want to be able to place interventions on this patient. And what is the smartest way to do this? And we think uh, we need three ingredients for this, essentially. So we're going to take the existing dietary signature of the user and we permut permutated it slightly in all the possible directions. But it's a very large space of possible interventions that you can imagine to, for example, tweak your breakfast or tweak your lunch, replace, for example, potatoes by rice or by something else, because there are so many, so many food groups out there. So we have a giant personalized intervention space, which is possible to rec recommend to the user, and we want to find this set of interventions, which essentially minimizes the loss function, which has two parts. One, we want to minimize the caloric intake rate of the patient, which comes out of the models. We have learned all the caloric equivalents of all the tags that we have in our app. On the other hand, if we would just have this component, the model would plainly suggest you to eat salad all day long which might not be necessarily healthy. So we have some, some distance to a healthy diet, where, again, our research partners come in handy. So they took the liberty of dissecting all the food tags that we have and um, yeah, looking at the components like um, saturated fats, fibers, uh, proteins, and so forth. And they also determine, okay, what are certain thresholds that must be met in order to stay healthy? And those two components essentially find us our optimized, personalized, and regularized set of interventions. And I brought an example here, which is really just an example, so don't take it for granted, to illustrate how this would all work together. So essentially, as an intervention, one could say, replace nuts in your current breakfast, cereals, dairy nuts with fruits, in order to gain an additional weight loss of 0.2 to 1.1 kilograms by the end of, of the treatment. And here, the, uh, all the things come together. Essentially, nuts was identified as something that is very calorie heavy. Your current breakfast is your, your current signature, which we just want to slightly tweak, not... Uh, suggest something entirely new, uh, cereals, dairy, and nuts with fruits. Because, for example, in the distance to healthy diet, it was penalized that this user has not eaten enough fibers. And fruits are also caloric quite low. Uh, and we can, uh, since we have a causal, fully interpretable model, we can say, okay, what is the equivalent, what is the efficacy of this intervention down the road? All right, and here, I'm already at my end. I hope I hit the 20-minute mark, roughly. 